<laughs> Let's say good morning to our other co-host first, though, Alonzo Perry. Good morning, Alonzo. How are you? Good morning, Rob. Good morning. I'm kind of out of my element, like being over here. And uh, I'm also not a WVU fan, so the pit game rivalry, it's not. It means nothing it, to you. Yeah, you know, I'm actually a Notre Dame Irish fan. So. The fighting Irish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. Long time, long time. Harvey has so. disgust for you. Yeah. <laughs> and we look good this year. You know what Notre Dame fans say about West Virginians, right? I, I have no idea. And whenever they play West Virginia, they say Notre Dame fans that we have we have touched down Jesus, and West Virginia has touched down the callback by holding. That's what <laughs> they would say. Yeah, probably. Well, they they did win a national championship with a West Virginia born coach. Yeah, they did, yeah. and they also won a national championship in in uh, keeping West Virginia out of win winning one. I know, right? That one hurt. Hey, Joey Garcia is our guest. He is a Democrat from the seventy six. That's Marion County, where they have several of my people. That is those whose names end in a vowel. Italians, right? So <laughs> here I am, Joey. Good morning to you, buddy. Hey, good morning. Great to be here with you guys. Great to have you with us. Uh, do you have a rooting interest in the Pitt Penn State game, or are you, uh, Pitt? Sorry, Pitt WVU game, or are you also a Notre Dame fan? Oh, I'm a I'm a WVU fan through and through. My brother was a former Mountaineer mascot no back way. in I think 2015. That's awesome. I uh, know some of my earliest memories are uh, watching and all as as Pitt fans and WVU fans fought in the stands. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I, I, I'm born and raised in Pittsburgh. I'm a Pitt fan. I've never been to a Pitt WVU game in Morgantown, however. The last WVU game I went to, uh, I think, was a, a WVU Syracuse game. And after the game, Don Nealon resigned. So from that point forward, people have asked me to stay away. It's bad for coaches in Morgantown. So I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joey, you are uh, one of a uh, declining breed in the state, and that is the Democratic Party uh, person elected to the legislature, and you recently lost another one. So I th- you're down to, what, 10 active at the moment? 10 active. We, we will gain one. Uh, delegate Scaff uh, resigned as a Democrat, so there will be a Democrat appointed to his position. Mm-hmm. Do you have any uh, idea when yeah, that's... Yeah, we're 11 in the House and 3 in the Senate right now. When is, do you have any idea when that appointment is going to take place? I think it normally take place within 10 days. Uh, actually, I think the Executive Committee in Kanawha County is already... They have to give the governor three names, and then I think he... Actually, I think he has five days to select who will be our next delegate from, I think it's the 54th district. Mm-hmm. Now you've been, you've been described to me by Delegate Hornby, who is the owner of this radio station, as a Joe Manchin-type Democrat. Would you agree with that characterization? I, I certainly respect and, and appreciate a lot of what Joe Manchin has done for the state of West Virginia. I think I'm my own man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, 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 I've certain positions, I've, I have different positions from Joe, but one thing that I really agree with him on uh, is the way that he tries to work across the aisle and build relationships. And that's something I've always prided myself on. I want to talk to you about some of the committees that you're on because uh, a couple of these committees are very much of importance in this eastern panhandle, and specifically where we sit in Berkeley County here. One of those jails and prisons because we host the Eastern Regional Jail here in Berkeley County, and also uh, your work with uh, fire departments and uh, emergency medical services because that's obviously a point of discussion throughout the state, but especially in a growth county like Berkeley County. Let's start first with jails and prisons and tell me how much progress we have made in helping to fix this situation in West Virginia. Well, uh, we had a special session back in August and we did um, somewhat significant pay raises for correctional officers and there's a number of different things that are work. Basically, what we did, the legislature didn't set what the pay raises would be, but we appropriated money. And there's a plan from the governor's office and the Division of Corrections about how, depending on someone's rank, um, how they're going to increase their salaries. The, the thing about it, though, is I don't think we went far enough. And especially in places like the Eastern Panhandle, um, which w- one of my first jobs was at Legal Aid of West Virginia in Martinsburg. So that's where I started my, my legal career uh, as far as what I do in my private practice. But, you know, th- you guys are facing such a huge disparity as far as the number of job opportunities and how much it costs to live out there, which is different than a lot of other places in the state of West Virginia. Yeah, um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, Matt Harvey, you deal with the jail system on a regular basis as a prosecutor with uh, Jefferson County. What would you like to see done about this issue? 
If if I had like a magic wand and I could just well, I, you, or a hoop, <laughs> a magic hoop. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would. I, you have to get the you have to compensate the people that work in the jails. Um, you, competitively in this area that there is a training ground for for the maryland correctional facility which is just across the river and and um you know i would like to see some stability in the ranks with the employment which is goes along with this because if i don't go there as much as i used to when i was a defense attorney but the turnover is phenomenal and it look they they're just uh, uh, the they look like kids the, the guards they're so young mm-hmm. and you know this is a lot of them's probably their first job and and this is a heck of a way to start a career it's just unbelievable and then they, they just burn out so quick that they're gone within a, a, a week or so so i'd like to see some stability in the retention of the employees alonzo as for what should we do with corrections and you know, how to fix the problem or, or a question you might have for joey garcia regarding it oh uh, well i mean you know you guys have a, a jail over there in Marion County or uh, Montegallia, um, am I correct? Well, no, so the, the closest regional jail we have is, is North Central Regional Jail, which is actually in Doddridge County. So I'm, I'm a, part of my practice is I do defense work, and so I'll go, it takes about an hour to get down there. Um, but, but, you know, in this area, we have a lot of oil and gas, um, especially people that, that may have or be able to get their CDL license. And I've heard stories of people driving on the way to work getting stopped, oil and gas companies saying, hey, we'll, we'll double your salary right now if you come to work with us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and that's it's very hard here to keep people. But I know there's similar challenges over where you all live. Okay. Uh, so I guess when it comes to the actual um, problems that you guys are experiencing over in Marion, um, and since you have a familiarity with Berkeley and kind of Martinsburg in this area, uh, is there a... a giant differential that you'd see in some of the uh, uh, issues that you guys have in your area as opposed to us here in these growth counties? Uh, I think that I think one of the main things that can be more helpful um, when it, when you look at salary and compensation is making sure people understand where they're going to be in, in several years ahead. And that's what I'd like to see from legislation and a salary structure, not just for the officers, which that's very important, but also staff members. And I think that's where we're, we're, we're missing out. Because if, if I'm coming in as a CO1, and we did improve things to some degree as far as where people will go as a CO2, a CO3, once they've been there two to three years, but people have to see this as a career. And they have to see this as, as a job which when people are cussing at you, sometimes they're throwing excrement at you. I mean, it's pretty disgusting what can happen in a jail. They have to see that there's going to be a pathway to take care of themselves and their family down the road. And, and I think that's what we need is more of a long-term strategy. Hmm. One of the other committees, of course, dealing with fire departments and emergency services. Uh, Joey, this is a particular interest here in the Eastern Panhandle because of some of the legislation and ways of distributing funds that you folks were discussing uh, in the legislature during your previous session. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And since you have knowledge of Berkeley County as being a growth county, so you're quite aware of our issues here, uh, how your feelings uh, were affected with your votes on those issues? So I I think we had a piece of legislation that that will help provide some more funding every year to volunteer fire departments uh, and and providing some EMS services too. And that money, on one hand, everybody will get part of the funding. And then there's another, so there's I think $3 million where that's the case. There's another $3 million where if you have an excess levy that goes towards fire department and EMS services, that those counties will get some of that. So basically those that are helping themselves will also get more money, which I think is a good thing. Um, you know, th- this is basically it's $12 million that is put as a line item in the budget. So I mean, one concern that I have is, is, you know, we are facing great economic times right now in the state of West Virginia with respect to how much money we're bringing in the budget. But when that goes away, and I think at some point um, we're going to have to face tighter economic circumstances, if not 
situations where I think we may have budgets that are in the red. Is that going to hold up? So I, I think it would have been better to have special revenue funding that we know is always going to be there for that purpose. But I think with the way Berkeley County, um, one of the most important things is to have these services there uh, for insurance rates and, and as a way to keep the cost of living down for people. So, I, you know, I, I don't know if there's more we can do. I hope there is. Do you interact with much paid staff in uh, Marion County? With well, paid staff as far as paid uh, paid uh, fi- uh, fire, fire service? Fire service, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. We, I mean, we have uh, paid fire service in the city of Fairmont, um, and, and certainly we have a Marion County Ambulance um, Emergency Services. And so, you know, they do a, a tremendous job, and, and it is a little bit different. Uh, but I, I live in a community that has that, along with a lot of the volunteer departments that are in all the little communities that we have. Do you have the same paid staff versus volunteer staff tensions that we have here in the Eastern Panhandle? I, th- I think there are to some degree. Um, I, I do think that they try their best to work together. Um, and I think that each is very important. Um, and especially, again, these volunteer fire services, um, you know, the people there are only there because they care so much about their communities and their work is very important. But, um, you know, those people that have a career with fire service, I mean, that it's, it's, it's amazing work. It's very difficult work. And, again, it's something that's, that's much needed. Are they having trouble getting volunteers in any of the volunteer departments that you are aware of? Yeah, that recruitment's always a very big issue. And I know that, um, you know, some people – I've heard about uh, trying just to get people in, the, you know, steps that need to be taken, and are they, you know, they're very rigorous, and there's a lot that needs to be learned so that people are safe on the job, and I think there's sometimes uh, questions about whether the modalities can be more flexible to try to bring people in, especially young people who, um, you know, there's just a different breed of people today. And it's important to try to get the right ones in there that are going to do a good job, but that can, you know, so we have enough people when the calls go out. I want to talk to you about the Democratic Party in general in West Virginia, Joe. As you mentioned, at this time, 10, and eventually you'll get back to 11 delegates, three in the Senate, none of the constitutional officers. So at the major party level, you have 14 representatives in the state, which is kind of the polar opposite of about 25 years ago when the numbers were tilted so incredibly the other way. Uh, how do you read the state right now politically? Do you, do you think that the representation in the House of Delegates and the Senate equals how the folks in the state of West Virginia are politically? I, you know, I really don't think it's balanced, and I do not think, although we've certainly, um, as a state, the states voted more Republican, but we also had redistricting that occurred this, this uh, 2021 legislative session. Um, and so the last time that we had elections, a lot of those lines were drawn with some of the best technology and understanding of demographics um, that, that has ever been available. And the Republican leadership used that very well. Um, so, I, I mean, I, do, I don't believe if, you, if you're looking at statewide, uh, the number of people who, who believe, because it's not always about party affiliation, but believe or vote Republican or Democrat, that we're way off balance from, uh, you know, where people are and what people want to see. So, and, and I'm running right now for state Senate. I actually announced about three weeks ago uh, running for Senator Mike Caputo's seat because Mike is not going to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to finish out his term and he's not going to run for re-election. And, but our area is a very strong Democratic area. And uh, it's, it's the area around Fairmont and Morgantown. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's not easy being a Democrat always. I think sometimes um, it's, you know, some of the things – the way that I think Republicans have done a great job in, in talking about things in two or three word uh, phrases, things that are easy to understand, we have to do a better job of that. Um, but I, I mean, one of the things that I've tried to do in my campaigns, that I think is the number one issue that I've seen, is that we need to have policies that help everybody stay, rebuild, and succeed in West Virginia. Because the number one issue I hear from people in my area is that 
we don't have enough opportunities here. We don't have the healthcare system and education system that is going to always attract people and then keep people, uh, get the opportunity for people to come back home. And we've lost population. I know the Eastern Panhandle is different. And, and, and I think in a lot of ways it's a model for how the rest of the state can hopefully develop those opportunities. Uh, but I think even the Eastern Panhandle, uh, you know, right now it's very solidly Republican. But I think it could very well in the next 10, 15 years, um, I think that line can move. Uh, and I'd hope that's the case for the rest of the state of West Virginia. You mentioned WVU and obviously uh, the funding issues that they have at the school. Some have blamed those funding issues on the legislature for not keeping up its end of the funding for the university. Others have said they've mismanaged their money at that school. They need to get their ship in order. Where do you come down? I think it's really about legislative priorities. And, and so my former job, before I was a delegate and elected in 2020, and I've been here for three years, in the legislature, I worked for Governor Earl Ray Tomlin, and I was his deputy general counsel and legislative director, and I worked for Jim Justice as a senior counsel for legislation and policy until he switched parties uh, in August of 2017. And I've seen every year I was there, we had negative budgets. We never had a year that we weren't in the red. And one of the first things to get cut back then was higher education funding every year. And the legislature, when we finally started to see more revenue come in, um, we did not increase or get back to where those levels that we were with higher education. And so if you look at inflation and you look at where we could have been if we would have had prioritized and kept that funding or at least kind of reprioritized once we had the money, um, I don't think we'd be in a situation like we are right now where WVU is having um, a gap of $45 million. And so one of the things I've asked the governor to do, and, and uh, I, you know, it sounds like it's not going to happen, but that, you know, we have the, the biggest surplus in the history of the state of West Virginia right now, $2 billion that we had last year. Uh, we have the ability to, if nothing else, smooth out the process uh, to, to allow WVU to find its footing and, uh, and not make some of these cuts that they're looking at right now. Alonzo. So is, is there any ways that you're different, like uh, bringing yourself to your constituents in a different way than maybe the national party when it comes to talking about the issues with them? I mean, is it financial? Is it social? I mean, what, like, how do you kind of navigate uh, talking to, you know, more of a moderate kind of Democratic crowd? And then also, you know, uh, I guess balancing it with some of the more progressive base. Like, wh where do you lean on this? Are you a Bernie kind of guy? Are you more, you know, uh, Joe Manchin in that sense? Like, what, what, how do you approach it? And what problems are you bringing? Or I guess solutions are you bringing to your constituency? That's a great question. I, I think um, I wouldn't necessarily call myself any type of guy. And, and I think that's, that's one of the problems for Democrats in West Virginia is I don't know that there's a perfect example of somebody who I would follow to the ends of the earth. Um, you know, I the way that I talk to my constituents and I listen to my constituents is is a conversation of trying to meet them where they are. But also, I, one one of the things that I think is very important because we've had a lot of people over the past you know eight ten years that have switched parties. And, and those switches have been almost entirely Democrat to Republican. Some of them have been, in my opinion, uh, to gain a political edge, not because people necessarily change what it is that they believe. So I try to tell people from the start, um, I'll tell you exactly what I think about any issue. This is who I am. But I think first and foremost, it has to come from those values that we share. And we can have a difference of opinion on an issue but if if we can connect on the things that we agree about, um, I still hope. I mean, there's some single member or single issue voters that you know I I uh, have voted against every uh, anti-abortion bill that's that's come up there, and I tell people um, why though. I, I don't think government should get involved in that, and that's you know that's a hard issue to discuss, and some people would turn me off right away. But I try to explain it to them, and I also try to be reasonable with them and listen to their side of the story, and hopefully they'll give me a chance. And that's all I can ask for as a candidate and as a public servant. 
And so you're not upset by the like financial stewardship since Republicans have take over. You said you worked for er- or Earl Ray Tomlin, and there was a, a deficit when he was you know leaving office, mm-hmm. and slowly as there was a, a transition. So you don't have any problems with the way that uh, Republicans are actually operating the financial aspect of the state. Is that well, correct? Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's there's certain things I probably do differently. I would have done the tax cuts that we've done differently last year. Um, I would have probably, uh, you know, we offered a bill that would have fully gotten rid of the income tax for anybody making $80,000 or less. And actually, for people that make more than that, they would have gotten a tax cut on the first $80,000 there. So, I mean, do, I, do we have differences of opinion on certain things? Yes. I mean, there's certain things I might spend money on differently or, or increase priorities? Yes. But I've voted for every budget that's come through here, and I've tried to work in good faith with people like Eric Householder um, and, and others who, I mean, he's been the finance chair the last couple of years, Vernon Chris, um, who's been the finance chair this last year, who is a delegate from uh, Wood County. You know, I, I, I believe in working across the aisle in good faith. And again, we may not always exactly agree, um, but, you know, I'd like to think that I'm reasonable enough to, to come to the table and, and see where we can find common ground. Joey, I appreciate your appearance on the program today. My audience uh, on occasion will say, can you get a Democratic delegate on the show? And I say, I just, I just have to search a little bit to get one because we don't have one of the Eastern Panhandle. So uh, obviously this is not your district and there's no compelling reason for you to come on this show and, and uh, represent the Democratic Party since this is not y- your district. But I do appreciate you doing it. And uh, I thank you for your time this morning. Any final thoughts? Oh, just, just this has been a joy and a pleasure to be with you guys. I'll come back anytime you you'll have me. Appreciate it. And uh, I love you know uh, again the, the Eastern Panhandle has a really special place in my heart. That's where I met my wife. Uh, that's where I started my legal career. And uh, you know I got to see when I was in Governor Tomlin's administration uh, some of the first investments that were made there in P and G and Macy's and and a lot of the wonderful things are going on. So I really uh, have an appreciation. For, for all that's going on there, and I just wish you all the best and uh, look forward to having more conversations with you in the future. What uh, what year did you leave the Eastern Panhandle? I was only here for a, for a summer, and, 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 I, and I did all those things in that short period of time. I, I, <laughs> so my wife, Heather, was working for Legal Aid at the same time, and, and again, luckily, uh, uh, the stars aligned, and so um, it was a great time. By the way, you and I share the same birthday 20 years apart. Suffice it to say, January thirtieth. Yeah. You're an Aquarius too. <laughs> I am, sir. I'm just a little older than you, <laughs> by a generation. Well, we got the best birthday week. I think we. I think someone told me. Uh, what is it? Roosevelt. I think was born then. Mm-hmm. So we're in good company. We got some people. Hey, uh, give me a score in the Pitt WVU game, Joey. Uh, we're going with uh, forty-one to fourteen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's ugly. <laughs> hey, I'm the eternal optimist. If you haven't already noticed by my <laughs> how I've come across here, you got to be to be one of the ten men standing there in the house, buddy. <laughs> hey, Joey, thanks That's so right. much. Thank you, Joey Garcia.